So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Serpy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ang solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or Type serp-p.pids.gov.ph Serpy has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, Serpy has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things. 
clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga polisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga polisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature PIDS policy studies and the insights of government policy makers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I am Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. The services sector is considered an engine of growth in Asia, 
In the Philippines, it has been one of the strongest and fast-growing sectors for years. In our webinar for this week, we will explore how the Philippines can further develop the services sector and seize a bigger share of the global market by boosting its participation in services trade agreements. To officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr. Sir? Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the following who have chosen to be with us today. From the government, uh, we have the Department of Agrarian Reform Acting Secretary uh, Bernie Cruz, Department of Science and Technology Assistant Secretary Leia Buendia, Department of Foreign Affairs Assistant Secretary Gina Hamuralin, Consul General Jesus Susan Paez, Diplomat Marian Ignacio, Director Arlene Gonzalez Macaiza, and Assistant Director Rain Mendoza. From Field Guarantee Corporation, we have Senior Vice President Nilia Oandasan. And we have Senior Economic Planning Officer, Director General uh, Ronald Golding, and Executive Director Merwin, uh, Merwin Salazar. And that's, six, six, that's Senate Economic Planning Office. And for the House of Representatives, you have Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director, Elsie Gutierrez, and Socioeconomic Research Bureau Executive Director, Manuel Aquino. From the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, Bureau of International Trade and Relations, you have Director Marie Cyrilin Akia, and Department of Information and Communication and Technology Directors, Mario Cunado and Paul Tuason. From the Commission on Population and Development, Regional Director Alexander Macian, Macinano. And from the National Economic Development Authority, we have Assistant Director Richard Emerson Bas Balister. And from Banco Central ng Pilipinas, we have Senior Director Maria Teresa Duenas. And the National Academy of Science and Technology Academicians, uh, William Padolina. From the private sector, we have a uh, Golden Crest President. Maria Bilen Lim from the Academy. Let me acknowledge the following University of San Carlos President Narciso Silian, University of the Philippines Director Hiras Sadel uh, Flores, uh, Mariano Marcos University Director Lawrence Jan Tagata, Northern Iluino Polytechnic State College Batad Campus Associate Director Eva Montero, University of the Philippines Virata School of Business Dean Joel Tan Torres. Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Dean Lualhati de la Cruz. From the CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have the Embassy of the Philippines in Berlin, Charity Affairs, uh, Ad Interim Lilibet Puno, APIC Business Council, uh, Advisory Council Director Antonio Basilio, Philippine Exporters Confederation Incorporated Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Sinin Perlada, uh, Research Education and Institution Development Foundation Incorporated Chairperson Thomas Aquino, uh, Philippine Business for Education Executive Director La Baseliote, Lorma Community De Development Foundation Incorporated Executive Director Andrew uh, Cesar Rimando, and Sectoral, Representative Al Sec Sectoral Transparency Alliance on Natural Resource Governance uh, Director Chadwick Lianos and Masaganang Sakhan Incorporated Director, Daniel Agustin. Let me acknowledge also our friends from the media. Finally, let me also greet our friends, colleagues from government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching to the PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Today, we focus our discussions on boosting the country's participation in various service trade agreements. The services sector plays an essential role in both global and local economies. For example, in 2019, World Development Indicators uh, showed that the services sector accounted for 61% of the global gross domestic product in 2018. We also observed its faster rate of increase than the agriculture and manufacturing sectors. Moreover, according to the World Trade Organization or WTO, 
The sector is estimated to grow globally in developing globally and in developing economies by 50% and 50% and 15% respectively. These figures, however, are estimated on the assumption that there is a reduction in trade costs and face-to-face -face interactions and lowering of services uh, trade bar barriers. This prospect highlights the importance of participating in trade negotiation and agreements. The book behind the borders policies assisting in addressing non-tariff measures stresses that while liberalization in trade in goods focuses on reducing tariffs, services trade liberalization, on the other hand, involves non-tariff measures uh, in the form of various regulations that limit market access against, uh, against foreign service suppliers. Trade agreements help countries facilitate the liberalization process, create framework for trade, and encourage support for liberalization of services markets. This afternoon, we will feature the PIDS study a review of the Philippine participation in trade in services agreements authored by PIDS research fellow, uh, Dr. Ramonit Sirafika and PIDS research analyst, Queen Seal Oren. It reviewed the Philippine participation in the services trade agreements at the multilateral, regional, and bilateral levels. It also discussed the government's institutional arrangements for trade in services negotiations. According to this PIDS study, uh, most services negotiations have been confined at the regional rather than at the multilateral level for the last 20 years. Moreover, the WTO reported in 2019 that there have been an increase in the number of regional trade agreements related to services, especially in developing countries. Dr. Serapika will be sharing with us the performance of the Philippines in these negotiations. She will also provide recommendations on how the country can harness the benefits of participating in services trade agreements. We have invited government agencies closely involved in the negotiations to deepen our discussions. I want to thank the National Economic and Development Authority Director for Trade and Trade Services and Industry Staff, Bien Ganapin, and Department of Trade and Industries Bureau of International Trade Relations Assistant Director, Shirilin Akia, for joining us this afternoon. We also have a co-chair of the Philippine Services Coalition and the President and CEO of A. Magsaysay Incorporated, Ms. Doris Magsaysayho, who will share her insights on how the Philippines can enhance its participation in services trade. Thank you very much for attending uh, our webinar for this week. Your participation in the open forum is also highly encouraged. And I'll give back the floor to our moderator, Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obeta, for uh, setting the tone of today's uh, webinar. So friends, at this point, I now invite all of you to listen to our featured uh, presentation for this week, which as mentioned by Dr. Orbeta, is the PIDS study titled, A Review of Philippine Participation in Trade in Services Agreements, offered by Dr. Ramonet Serafika and Queen uh, Sal Oren. The presentation will be delivered by Dr. Serafika, who is a senior research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. She has conducted numerous studies on services, uh, trade, policy, and regulation, and have also published on these topics. Dr. Serapi has worked in regional organizations and, has also, and also has a private sector experience in both um, academia and industry. She obtained her PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I now give you Dr. Ramonet Serapika for her presentation. Monet, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. CR. So good afternoon. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I would like to acknowledge, uh, uh, as mentioned, the contribution of my co-author, Queen Sel Oren, and also thank the uh, Bureau of International Trade Relations of the DTI, the Trade Services and Industry Staff of NEDA, and the Philippine Services Coalition for assisting us during the preparation of this paper by providing information and sharing their um, experience and insights, and of course, for taking part uh, in this webinar. Next slide, please. So uh, I will first provide the context of the paper, then describe the institutional arrangements for trade in services negotiations. The third part is the meat of the paper, where we review the participation of the country in various agreements at the multilateral level, regional, and bilateral levels. 
It examines the country's services-related commitments and identifies the opportunities available. I will then conclude with some of the challenges that need to be addressed for the country to maximize uh, its participation in agreements. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so um, as mentioned by Dr. Abeta, the contribution of services is significant and it continues to grow. I think by now it's almost um, close to 70% of our global GDP. And in terms of cross-border trade, services make up approximately one quarter or a quarter of the value of global trade. And it is expected to grow by as much as 50%. So will account for uh, a third of global trade by 2040 if the reduction uh, in trade costs are um, accomplished. Now, in the last 20 years, most of the services trade openings have been bound in regional trade agreements rather than in the WTO. And unlike trading goods, which focuses on uh, reduction in tariffs, for services, it's really about the reduction or removal of price regulations. And um, of course, we can liberalize autonomously or unilaterally, but what are, there are benefits from doing it within the context of a trade agreement. So this include, for example, number one, the trade agreements help the liberalization process by providing a framework with a set of principles, rules, and disciplines. Number two, because these are international contracts that cannot be changed uh, unilaterally, trade agreements create a more stable framework for trade. And then thirdly, because of the reciprocal nature of uh, trade liberalization in these agreements, it could also boost the political support for liberalization in the services markets. Next, please. Now we observe that the Philippines has not been active compared to its ASEAN neighbors in foraging trade agreements. So um, these are the, in, in the table that uh, we have here, it shows the number of agreements that are already being implemented or signed. And as members of ASEAN, there are at least eight agreements that are common to all. And if we include those that are still under negotiation, actually the, the difference would even be larger. However, um, we note that it is the country's interest to participate in agreements because, and, and therefore pursue market access because of the comparative advantage of the Philippines in the services sector. Next slide, please. So in general, we want to assess how the Philippines can maximize uh, our participation in FTAs to realize the gains uh, from liberalization and facilitation. And specifically, we look at the uh, role of FTAs in delivering these benefits. Number two is to look at the challenges uh, at the regulatory and institutional levels. And then thirdly, identify the gaps and provide recommendations. Next, please. Okay, so now I will focus on the institutional arrangement. Uh, next. So before I uh, go into the details, I think it's important to discuss that or consider that there are many steps involved in, um, a, in trade negotiations for, for us to realize the benefits. So there are five key moments as according to Marconi, uh, Marconini and Sauvé. First is we have to have a, a national plan or uh, for services. We have to have a national strategy for services. Number two is uh, preparing for services negotiations. So this would involve developing a negotiating strategy and also conducting trade-related uh, regulatory audit. Number three, uh, the third step is the actual conduct of the negotiations where uh, you, we devise uh, strategies for the um, requests and offers that uh, either our requests and offers or those of our trade partners. And then the fourth um, um, step would be uh, the implementation of the negotiated outcomes. At this point, we have to address the regulatory capacities and also uh, some bottlenecks that uh, we can identify. And then finally, and actually this is the most important, ultimately, is that the ability to supply to newly open markets with competitive and international, um, international uh, uh, service suppliers that can meet the demands of the global market. So it's important to have a mechanism to support each of these steps. Next slide, please. So in our development plan, uh, chapter nine uh, recognizes, and the chapter nine is on industry and services. It recognizes the importance of services and strategies to promote trade in services. 
So for example, it highlights the role of ITBPM, education, healthcare, logistics, construction, transport related services, and the creative industries. The plan also identified priority reforms to remove barriers uh, to foreign investments. And then uh, another chapter on competition policy is also relevant because it promotes fair competition, especially in transport, energy, and telecommunication services sectors. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of the uh, in institutional setup by law, there are two principal agencies involved um, in negotiating the country's international commitments. So we have the DTI, which is mandated to take the primary role in negotiating and reviewing existing international trade agreements. And then the other lead agency is the DFA, which is mandated to implement the three pillars of the Philippine foreign policy. Now, the, there are two groups in effect that uh, with similar memberships that are responsible for trade agreements. These are the Committee on Tariff and Trade Related Matters and the Philippine Council for Regional Cooperation. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Committee on uh, Tariff and Related Matters advises the President and the NEDA Board on tariff and related matters and coordinates agency positions and recommends national positions in international economic negotiations. Uh, there are three levels in the CTRM. You have the committee proper, the technical committee, and uh, the subcommittees. There is a special technical committee on WTO matters uh, whose main function is to examine and recommend the Philippine position uh, at the WTO. And under the TCWM, uh, the Interagency Committee on Trade and Services uh, 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 leads the negotiations, and it is the NEDA that acts as the chair of this, part, of this particular uh, Interagency Committee, and it receives secretariat assistance from NEDA's Trade Services and Industry staff. Next slide, please. Okay, in uh, the second group is the Philippine Council for Regional Cooperation, which was created in 2011 to facilitate interagency coordination um, uh, and formulation of the Philippine policy towards uh, our relations or in various regional and interregional organizations and fora. So uh, this would include, for example, ASEAN, APEC, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN uh, Asia Europe meetings and the Forum for East Asia Latin America cooperation. Uh, the PCRC involves four uh, cabinet level uh, technical boards. And um, there's also under the AMTB is a committee on ASEAN Economic uh, Committee. The CAEC is chaired by the DTI and composed of the various departments and agencies concerned with ASEAN economic uh, and financial cooperation. Now, under the CAEC, DTI leads the services negotiations in ASEAN, ASEAN plus one FTAs and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Next slide. Uh, next slide, okay. So this table presents the members of the Interagency Committee on Trade in Services. And you have uh, DTI, NEDA, and DFA, um, and they are responsible for the uh, cross-cutting issues. But for specific modes of supply, you have, for example, for mode one, um, or cross-border supply. You have the Data Privacy Commission, for example, for mode two, consumption abroad, you would have um, Department of Tourism. For mode three, which is about uh, the establishment of commercial presence, you would have BOI and SEC. And then for mode four, or the movement of natural persons, this would be handled by the uh, DOLE. And then, of course, for each of the sectoral uh, issues, you would have the relevant agencies um, participating. So in a particular agreement, either the DTI or the NEDA would handle the coordination of services negotiations. Uh, as we understand, however, they have no veto power over positions taken by other agencies, and trade policy making is done by consensus. And then individual departments and agencies bring their own initiatives, research, and trade positions. So to summarize, we have two lead coordinate. Uh, we have two lead coordinators for services negotiations, and the responsibility for shepherding the a particular nego uh, negotiation depends on the trade forum or footprint of the agreement. Next slide, please. 
So now we will, uh, I will present the review of uh, the Philippine participation in various trade agreements. Next. So we start at the multilateral level. So the agreement at the multilateral level is relatively young compared to the counterpart in goods. The general agreement on trade and services uh, was signed in 1994, whereas the um, general agreement on tariff, tariffs and trade was signed in 1947. So the GATS uh, establishes a set of rules and disciplines governing the use um, by WTO members of various measures affecting services trade. And uh, trade is liberalized uh, through a series of market access and national treatment commitments specified in the schedules, which describe the, the terms, limitations, and conditions. Uh, the GATS also uh, defines standards of transparency and uh, several other disciplines on good governance for the services sector. It is important to highlight that the GATS explicitly recognizes the right of, it, of the members to regulate, to pursue its national uh, policy objectives. Next slide. So these figures reflect the subsectors included in the schedule of the Philippines and, it, and its trade partners. The left panel shows the commitments of ASEAN member states in the GATS. And uh, please note that we, uh, we only counted the subsectors. It does not reflect the depth of the commitments uh, made across the sectors. So whether or not uh, full or partial commitments were, were made are not reflected here. Uh, nonetheless, it shows that the Philippines, an original member of the WTO, committed fewer subsectors uh, compared to other members. And uh, you will also notice that Cambodia, Vietnam, and Lao PDR, which joined in 2004, 2007, and 2013 respectively, uh, included more subsectors in their commitments. And then the right panel shows the subsectors uh, of the other, of the commitments of the other FTA partners of the Philippines, and again, uh, showing that the Philippines committed fewer um, subsectors compared or except for India. And uh, to date, further multilateral uh, negotiations, well, it started in 2001 under the Do uh, Doha Development Agenda, but no outcomes have been achieved uh, so far in terms of additional market openings. The most recent achievement at the WTO in terms of services is the um, signing of the Joint Initiative on Services uh, Domestic Regulations, uh, which was uh, signed last year. And, and, and uh, I believe the Philippines uh, joined uh, this particular uh, initiative. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, in terms of bilateral agreements, the Philippine-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement was the first FTA signed by the Philippines in 2006. Uh, the agreement contains a chapter on services trade with an annex on financial services and a chapter on the movement of natural persons. Uh, commitments were made using the positive list approach, so similar to GATS. And um, however, these commitments also included a standstill obligation which means that they do not deviate from the current laws and regulations or they observe the status quo. Uh, this ensures transparency and stability of the domestic laws and regulations. And the, the Japan or the Philippine Japan uh, EPA was the first agreement that adopted this approach uh, with respect to services. And then the Japan Malaysia and Japan Indonesia EPAs followed um, accordingly. The, the EPA also requires the preparation of, trans, of a transparency list, which is a list of existing measures not conforming to market access and national treatment obligations. Um, a transparency list is purely um, prepared for the sole purpose of increasing the transparency of restrictions. Um, okay, so compared to the uh, GATS, the Philippines added 38 new commitments. Uh, in uh, PJPA, um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, compared to, um, uh, so the Philippines added 38 new commitments, but removed seven, uh, resulting in 74 scheduled subsectors. For Japan, it offered its entire GATS commitments and added 35 subsectors for a total of 139 subsectors. 
And additionally, um, so as I mentioned, you, uh, in this particular agreement, there's a commitment to indicate uh, the status quo or make standstill commitments. So the table on the right uh, lists the new commitments made by both parties under the Philippine-Japan EPA compared to the GATS, or to the left, rather. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so through the agreement, Japan expanded the categories of natural persons allowed to supply services and specifically included nurses and caregivers. Uh, as of in only about 30 uh, of the 547 nurses and 20% uh, 20 of the care workers passed the Japanese qualification exams. And um, however, uh, in terms of other aspects of the agreement, uh, uh, the PJPA is also promoting better cooperation and capacity building projects to benefit the services sector. Um, so cooperation includes activities in ICT, transport, uh, transportation, financial and tourism services, among others. Uh, in the latest general review, two working groups were created to study the inclusion of uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises and e-commerce in the agreement. Uh, and then uh, there's, of, of course, ongoing efforts to negotiate, improve, uh, improve market access. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next is the Philippines European F, uh, FTA, FTA, so EFTA, which is the second bilateral uh, FTA of the Philippines. It uh, includes uh, the EFTA states, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. Um, and it entered into force in 2018 uh, for the Philippines, Norway, and Liechtenstein. But for Switzerland, it entered into force in January, 20, uh, January 2020. The chapter on services trade closely follows the GATS approach. It uh, covers uh, all the four modes of uh, uh, all services sectors and all four, four modes of supply. And there's also a separate annex on financial services, telecommunications, movement of natural persons, maritime transport, and energy related services to complement the chapter with additional disciplines uh, specific to those sectors. So, next slide, please. Uh, the Philippines committed the least number of subsectors compared to the EFTA member states. Uh, so comparing, uh, if you compare it with GATS, Philippines and Liechtenstein committed more, sub, uh, uh, more subsectors in the PHFTA uh, because for the Philippines, we start, we start from a low base. So in terms of the increment, it's uh, significant. Uh, you will notice also that no country made commitments in health-related and social services uh, possibly indicating that this is a sensitive sector for um, bound liberalization. Uh, next slide, please. So the Philippines made 41 new commitments in PHFTA. And uh, so I won't uh, go into it because they're here in the slide. Uh, notice uh, to add up uh, to the total because in some cases, uh, uh, commitments made in GATS were not introduced in the uh, EFTA uh, agreement. Okay, um, next slide, please. So it's a relatively new agreement, and but uh, it is hoped that uh, Filipino services suppliers, particularly the skilled workers and professionals, will benefit from uh, movement of natural persons uh, commitments. Uh, for mode one and mode four, uh, it would help uh, suppliers and skilled labor and professionals, particularly in uh, architecture and uh, engineering. Um, the entry and temporary presence of service suppliers in, uh, in such as business visitors, uh, intercorporate transferees, and contractor service providers are also included. Um, and I think in, in some cases, the economic needs tests were also waived. So hopefully, uh, again, it's a relative agreement, and so hopefully the FTA will encourage uh, foreign direct investment uh, 
into the Philippines, particularly in the ITDPM sector, renewable energy sector, construction and related engineering, environmental, maritime transport, and financial services. Uh, next slide, please. Now, for the regional um, agreements, uh, we have ASEAN and the formal process of liberalization in ASEAN started with the signing of the ASEAN Framework, uh, Framework Agreement on Services in 1995. So uh, it has uh, essentially the aim is to create a free trade uh, area uh, in services and it uh, adopts a GATS plus principle, which means that uh, member states uh, sh shall schedule commitments under AFAS that go beyond their GATS commitments. And the results of the negotiations are formalized in packages of schedules of commitments under AFAS. And the latest package of commitment under the AEM is the 10th package. And there are also parallel um, uh, negotiations and commitments that can be found in finance, financial services, and also in, in, trans, in the transport sector or um, yeah, uh, under the purview of the ASEAN transport ministers. Okay, next slide, please. So this figure reflects the 10th package. This is the latest. Uh, 10th package based on the assessment of the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, ASEAN member states have made commitments to liberalize almost all of the services sectors and subsectors under the purview of the AEM, ranging from um, at least, I think, uh, the most is 122 out of the total universe of 128 the sensitive um, sectors or commercially insignificant uh, subsectors. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the latest development in ASEAN is the adoption of the uh, ASEAN Services Agreement uh, or ATISA, which is supposed to be the enhanced AFAS. So um, if you recall in AFAS, the goal was to create a free trade area in services. In ATISA, the goal is more ambitious because it really the economic integration and vision of the region. Uh, and therefore, um, in terms of the approach to negotiations, it's supposed to be more liberalizing because it now adopts the negative list approach. So under the negative list approach, member countries specify the sectors which are exempted from the obligations of liberalization. And these are contained in a list of reservations and non-conforming measures. Um, and there, in addition, there are also regulatory disciplines in ATISA that were not found or were not included in AFAS. The three sectoral annexes in ATISA are financial services, telecommunication services, and air transport ancillary services. Uh, mode 4 uh, will no longer be part of the services agreement as these are contained in a separate agreement, which I will discuss. Uh, next slide, please. So there are three uh, key ASEAN initiatives that promote the mobility of service suppliers in the ASEAN region. One is the movement of natural persons, which uh, is intended to provide the legal framework uh, towards eliminating substantially all restrictions in the temporary uh, cross-border movement of natural persons involved in the provision of trade, trade in goods, uh, trade in services, and investment. So um, uh, please note that it only uh, covers temporary entry and, uh, and stay of natural persons. Uh, it does not cover the movement of unskilled labor or those that are um, entering another country for the purpose of permanent employment or permanent migration. So these are not uh, covered. And then the uh, mutual recognition arrangements recognize the uh, uh, qualifications of foreign service suppliers by authorities in another country. And then the third initiative is the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, uh, which is a common reference framework to compare qualifications throughout uh, uh, the education and training sectors across the ASEAN member states. Uh, next slide, please. So, 
so there are seven professional services um, that are included in the or that have signed MRAs. And in addition, um, there is also a mutual recognition arrangement on tourism. And the focus now of ASEAN is uh, in implementing the MRAs and to improve the mobility of professionals in these uh, sectors. Next slide, please. So this table shows the registered ASEAN professionals. Uh, to Based on this table, Filipinos so far make up uh, of the ASEAN accountants in terms of ASEAN architects, 22%, and for ASEAN engineers, 12%. Next slide, please. Okay, so ASEAN is not only integrating its economy among its member states, but it also is engaging key dialogue partners uh, through the FTAs, uh, various FTAs and uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreements. And for uh, all of these FTAs, the liberalization of services is a key uh, feature. So I, I'll go to the next uh, more exciting uh, region. Next slide, please. So the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is the latest and largest preferential trade agreement to recognize increasing significance of services. RCEP is an agreement between um, ASEAN and the ASEAN FTA partners, uh, Australia, China, India, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. Uh, it was signed by the ministers in 2020 and, um, and eventually signed, uh, however, without India, and it entered into force this year. Uh, for the Philippines, this was signed in September by the president and is now waiting or is now being discussed at the Senate. Uh, so based on the assessment of the ASEAN Secretariat, the RCEP is significantly broader and deeper compared to all the ASEAN uh, FTAs, the other FTAs that I showed you earlier. In the area of trade and services, this includes a separate chapter for m and three annexes on uh, each on uh, one each on financial services, telecommunications and professional services, and uh, similar to ATISA, the, in the um, uh, latest or the uh, most prominent feature of the RCEP is the scheduling of market access commitments using the negative list approach, either at the conclusion of the negotiations or within a specific timeline after the entry of, uh, into force of RCEP. So um, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, China, and New Zealand initially adopted the, uh, the positive list, and I, I believe we have uh, three years to transition to a negative. Uh, so we adopted the positive list, and we have three years to transition to the negative list approach. Uh, the resulting trade in services and um, temporary movement of natural persons chapters, and along with the market access commitments under these chapters, uh, are considered to be uh, significantly better than any of the. Uh, previous FTAs, as I, as I have mentioned. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is from the, I think, the, an assessment from the DTI. Uh, uh, it shows the improved commitments under RCEP compared to the ASEAN plus, plus one FTAs. And again, RCEP members accord preferential treatment for skilled professionals and business persons uh, in legal, construction, engineering, and banking services. Uh, but I think the figures here are about um, commercial presence and the market access commitments um, for mode three in various in these sectors listed on the slide. And uh, another important aspect of RCEP is that there is a chapter on economic and technical cooperation that is built into the agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So the table shows the number of subsectors that the Philippines committed in RCEP. Uh, out of the total 155 subsectors, so that is the universe, the Philippines committed 103 subsectors, which is significantly higher than the 43 that we had committed in the multi in the GATS or at the multilateral level. So next slide, please. So now I will focus on the final part, which is to talk about the challenges and the way forward. Next slide. So um, since it, 
uh, the Philippines prepared its first schedule in the 1990s, the Philippines has expanded the coverage of subsectors that it has bound in agreements. So for comparability with the AFAS, we removed the uh, commitments in financial services, air transport services, and services covered in the uh, AKIA or the Agreement on Investment. So in a sense, uh, by binding more subsectors, the certainty or predictability of our policy regime has improved over time. Although, um, obviously, this is only with respect to our partners in preferential trade agreements. Next slide, please. Now, while the coverage has increased, the degree of bound liberalization is another issue. Water in the schedule of commitments refers to the difference between the bound level of restrictiveness and the actual or applied regulation. So this could occur uh, by not including any sector, which is the highest level of water, or, um, and, and this means that the fewer sectors you include, the higher the water or the policy space, uh, it's also called. Uh, another type of water is created when, for example, uh, quantitative limitations are more restrictive than what the domestic laws allow. So, as indicated in the previous tables, not all sectors have been included in the schedule of commitments of the Philippines. And in addition, there are cases where some sectors were included. However, the limitations were set at a more restrictive level than uh, what is allowed in our laws. So, um, uh, it should be noted that water uh, binding overhang or policy space uh, is not unique uh, in, to the Philippines. And so most all countries have water in their schedules. Uh, however, and, uh, and the extent of water could be significant. However, uh, there are welfare gains from, from reducing policy uncertainty by reducing the difference between bound and applied uh, policies and even by binding the status quo to encourage trade um, from our trading partners. So overall, commitments that bind the existing regime is preferred to one with water, although the latter would still be better than unbound policy regime. And services agreements provide a mechanism for parties to reduce policy uncertainty by setting an upper bound on the level of trade restrictiveness. So we know that um, there are recent policy reforms that will effectively open up key sectors in the economy. Uh, this will allow the government to have more policy space, which we recommend it should judiciously exercise in the context of international trade agreements so that uh, you have to balance the need for policy space uh, on the part of government, but at the same time, the need for of the private sector for more certainty in our policy regime. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the second issue uh, is, uh, focuses on um, uh, enhanced uh, seizing market opportunities. So a, a trade agreement does not end with the signing of the document. The next steps involve implementing negotiated outcomes and supplying newly open markets with services. So um, through the FTAs, the Philippines obtain market access and non-discriminatory treatment uh, with our various trading partners. However, and, and, and this may not be different from the actual policy, but uh, at least these are secured under the agreement. So it is important to engage and capacitate the private sector and assist uh, SMEs in particular. Uh, an, an organization such as the Philippine Services Coalition could be instrumental in making sure that the industry stakeholders are actively involved in each stage of in each stage of the services negotiation or nego uh, life cycle. So the final um, issue that we would like to raise, next slide, please, uh, refers to the um, uh, structure for negotiations. So in the updated development plan, it recognizes the need to strengthen the governance structure of trade negotiations. And we recommend that for trade in services, the first step towards strengthening governance would be to consolidate uh, negotiations in one agency instead of the current setup where the lead coordination role is split between two agencies, depending on the trade partner and the scope of the agreement. 
And so this, in our view, would ensure coherence and consistency in the uh, formulating the negotiating positions, uh, whether it's done at the bilateral, regional, or plurilateral levels and uh, multilateral levels. And in our view, it is the DTI rather than the NEDA that, uh, which would be a better fit because it's already uh, involved in trade negotiations. And it, uh, it, of course, in terms of linkage with the industrial policy and also uh, the business sector, uh, it would, um, I think we, we think the DTI would be better suited for the negotiations. It does not mean that NEDA does not play a role, of course. Uh, the role of NEDA is very important in providing uh, guidance and the overall trade policy. Uh, and later on in the assessment of gains and impacts. And NEDA could also focus in identifying and championing the domestic reforms that are needed to advance services trade um, and focus on this rather than in participating in trade negotiations. So this is the last um, recommendation. Um, I will conclude right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Serafika, for your uh, clear and comprehensive um, presentation. So we'll hear more from an entry in the open forum, and we'll also have the chance to unpack um, um, her recommendations as we uh, listen to uh, the um, comments of our reactors. Okay. So at this point, friends, let's continue the conversation. And this time, we'll hear from our invited experts on their comments and insights. and um, as mentioned by Dr. Serafika in her presentation, uh, the Department of Trade and Industry, or the DTI, is mandated to take the primary role in negotiating and uh, reviewing international uh, trade agreements. And with us today to share the views of the DTI's uh, Bureau of International Trade Relations is Assistant Director uh, Marie uh, Sherilyn Akia. Director Akia has led the um, APEC and WTO sections in the past and uh, will also lead the Bureau in preparing for the country's uh, CPTPP engagement. She was the coordinator for trade and investment issues during the APEC 2015 chairmanship of the Philippines, which, which uh, saw the adoption of the Boracay Action Agenda and the submission of an MSME discussion paper, which led to the establishment of the Friends of MSMEs and eventually the WTO Informal Working Group on MSMEs. She was also the chairperson of the APEC Committee on Trade and Investment in 2016 and 2017. Uh, Director Akia obtained her bachelor's degree at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, and she has master's units from the Ateneo de Manila University and Boston University. Friends, representing DTI Assistant Secretary for Industry Development and Trade Policy Group, Alan Gepti, here now is uh, Director Sherilyn Akia of the BITR. Lynn, you now have the virtual floor. Thank you, Dr. Sheila. Uh, good to see you again. I'm a Suki here at PIDS. I know you you asked as uh asked Alan to come, but he's uh, he's on leave and he asked me to to take his place. I only learned that I will do it yesterday. <laughs> so actually I'm not able to clear most of my remarks with uh with uh director Boots and with Asset Alan. So they are really my own, and I hope I will not be <laughs> quoted on this. But anyway, I really wanted to join the conversation. It's something that we we, we need to have. And uh, so I will go into that later. But before I begin, I'd like to thank you, the PIDS, uh, and also Dr. Minette and Steve for the study. Uh, it's uh, an honor to join the panel, um, especially with Director Ben and also with Mom Doris, uh, whom I have worked with uh, in the past in APEC. Um, before I continue, I'd like to say I'm not a services expert. And uh, however, I am part of the TCWM Secretariat, which was described in the study. I also had the chance to be part of the drafting team for the APEX Services Competitiveness Roadmap, which uh, came from the APEX Services uh, Cooperation Framework, which is one of our deliverables from our chairmanship of APEX in 2015. So now just going uh, to the study itself on the objectives 
of the study, which is to highlight the importance of the services sector. I, I don't think I need to go into the importance of the services, services sector to our economy. I think it's well accepted. The contributions to our GDP is very significant. And just as an example, uh, before the COVID struck in 20, um, in, in before the COVID struck in 2019, we had, um, 8 million tourists coming over, bringing in 550 billion pesos in international tourism receipts. And then in 2020, because of the pandemic, these revenues were halved in 2020. And so you see, talagang malaki talaga that the contribution is really big. But then on the other side of the story, we also the telecom sector the e-commerce and the financial services sector holding up really very well during the pandemic. And as a sector, services is also growing very fast and we export more than we import on services, which is good because we have a big trade surplus of, um, in 2020, it's around 13 billion US dollars. And this surplus really gets some of of the PTI, uh, parang it, it, it's also a cause of concern to some to some of us. Okay. Anyway, when we negotiate free trade agreements, we make offers to liberalize our services regime, and we also ask the same from our trading partners. So we also agree on disciplines and on rules, and this create the the more binding legal environment, which will help our Filipino services ex exporters. The rules, uh, they lead to predictability and also to a better environment, which will attract investments, create jobs, and also acquire technology. However, FTAs, they are only one tool that we use at the DTI to make our services sector competitive. We also have industrial investment policies and also our tax policies. So Dr. Monet referred to this point uh, already uh, in, in when she was presenting earlier. And uh, our board of investments, they work very hard to, to push for the legislation of the CREATE Act, Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises. Uh, so that, that was last year in March 2021. Then there was also the passage of the amendments to the Foreign Investment Act uh, signed this month, and also the Retail Trade Liberalization Act uh, signed uh, three months back last December. The amendments to the Public Service Act is awaiting the signature by the president. So essentially, our participation in the FTAs support our domestic efforts to improve the business environment, and they also complement the ongoing legislative reform measures. Our external trade strategy and our domestic reforms help send a, a good signal to the domestic and international community. And uh, it's a signal that we are committed to provide a more conducive business environment, that we will strengthen our services sector niche, and also create employment and support the economic recovery. So this study is really very important. In fact, we really want to thank the PIDS for doing this. Uh, we would, it would be one study that we would have wanted for uh, commission, but we were happy na parang Dr. Minet, oh, they're going to do a study on services. So we, we really welcome it. And uh, we appreciate the description on our services trade commitments at the GATS, at, at the different ASEAN FTAs, and its services chapter, the JEPA, the PHF, and also on the RCEP. And it uh, describes very well the government's institutional arrangements for trading services negotiations. It also identifies the current gaps in determining the utilization of the various arrangements. The findings and the recommendations of the PIDS on the need to improve governance structure for services trade policy formulation and negotiations are really relevant. This is a conversation that we should continue to have on a regular basis since the scope of negotiations and also the participants in the negotiations, they're changing, they're really evolving. Now we have even more comprehensive agreements. Even the TCWM membership, uh, our, it has changed from the time it was first put up in place. We had this set of agencies who are a member. Now it's a different, I mean, it's, it has also expanded. So parang 
uh, we 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 need to continue the conversation. So we also need to evolve. And as we continue to negotiate trade agreements with service of provisions, we also need to ensure that we are properly equipped and all efforts are aligned to achieve economic growth and development. Just a point on the bifurcated arrangement. Um, I do note that there's the PCWM and there's also so there's the the DTI side and also which is which is where the Ajax reports, and then there's also the CAE side, uh, which reports to the PCRC. So PCWM reports to the TRM. But actually, in practice, uh, even at the TRM, the CAE side also goes through the TRM. I that's what that's my understanding. Even in the Ajax, the CAE, uh, the ASEAN. Uh, negotiations are also discussed at the IAC. So parang eventually they all go through the TCWM, which goes all the way to the TRM. But I think maybe the line is not as clear. So maybe Director Bien would have some comments on this. Okay. As for my key takeaways, um uh I have three. The first is the the shift to the digital economy, which was accelerated during the COVID pandemic has made the goal of achieving competitiveness of services trade even more important. More important. So the competitiveness of our services industries in the digital economy will determine our future growth as a nation. E-services will continue to accelerate and services on its own right and as a support to trade in goods will become even more important. And managing this transition to digital trade is important. It will require a whole of nation approach, I would say, not just a whole of government approach. And well, we have comparative advantage in some sectors and moving forward, it will take on increasing significance, including in areas that are previously that, that previously require maximum policy space, such as on e-commerce and digitalization of conventional conventional services. So I note uh, we, we acknowledge that services liberalization has historically not been as extensive. So maybe just a point to the agencies involved in the following sectors, they will have a more important role to play. In. And these are on uh, telecoms, business, courier, distribution, financial, e-payments, transport, and logistics services. So we have to really watch out for these uh, sectors. And then the second takeaway is that the linkages with multiple stakeholders need to be strengthened in order to properly identify the country's offensive and defensive interests in services trade negotiations. Collaboration with all stakeholders is critical. I always like to say that business, the business community, they are always many steps ahead in terms of technology, and really they are in a better position to understand the commercial implications of these agreements. It is the business community, both the large and the business, who can identify the trade barriers that are put up by our trading partners. The academic community is also important. They can put forward new concepts, new concepts and ideas that the government negotiators may uh, may want to accept or support. At the same time, when we say private sector, I also speak for the consumers who are important stakeholders. Um, we should ask ourselves. Will our agreements lead to better, more affordable, and higher quality of service? Will it create more jobs? So better consultations and more transparency will level the playing field and also shield the government from lobbying by, uh, by narrow interests. The third takeaway is on the governance structure. Um, for trade and services negotiations, this can be further improved to pursue a cohesive, holistic, an inclusive trade policy with the different agencies handling different negotiations depending on the parties involved um, there is a tendency to take a minimalist approach to trade negotiations the negotiated the, the, the negotiations itself can be better coordinated and made more efficient with appropriate resources given to the uh, relevant agencies to properly pursue their mandate this would also allow for better retention of institutional knowledge and ensure that outcomes of trade negotiations are aligned with development goals. 
So three takeaways, um, e-services, transparency and multiple stakeholders and the governance structure. So I end my comments with that and thank you all and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Director Lin Aki of uh, the BITR. It's always a pleasure to have you at our webinar. Okay, so we'll hear more from uh, Director Lin during the open forum. Okay, so friends, um, the National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, uh, the country's premier socioeconomic planning bo body, as uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Serafik in her presentation, also plays an important role in trade negotiations. And with us this afternoon to give his take on the PIDS study as well as uh, his insights on how the country can boost its participation in services trade negotiations is Director Bien Ganapin of the Trade Services and Industry Staff of NEDA. Director Ganapin has been part of NEDA since 2003 and has assumed various positions at the uh, National Policy and Planning Staff of NEDA. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree in economics from uh, the University of the Philippines and his master's degree in public policy from the Hitotsubashi University in Japan. Director Ganapin, sorry, the, floor, the virtual floor is now yours. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, my um, my special thanks to the PIDS uh, for for inviting NEDA, uh, and uh, I, 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 I um, at the onset I would like to congratulate and commend Dr. Uh, Ramonet Mutsalafika and uh, Miss Queen uh, of, of PIDS uh, for preparing this uh, very informative study on the country's participation on trading services. Director so, Bien, can you turn on your hello. video, please? Can you turn? Uh, yes, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, wait. Okay. Is it uh, already on? Yes, it's on now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Now there have been very few notable uh, in-depth uh, studies that have been that have dealt on the trade in services agreements. One such uh, study was done by um, Aldaba and Aldaba in 2013, wherein they assessed the, the capacity building needs required to liberalize trade in the Philippines and uh, cited uh, institutional arrangements and obstacles to, to services liberalization. It's also worth noting that uh, the paper provided uh, the, the first published inventory of the ASEAN Framework Agreement on Services, or the AFAS commitments, from the first to the eighth uh, package. Now, this discussion paper provides a valuable and timely contribution an insight to the literature on trade and services in the Philippines. Um, the paper provides an, an updated and comprehensive inventory of the services commitments under the trade and services agreements uh, wherein the Philippines is, uh, is part of, as well as uh, detailed information on these uh, commitments. Now for, the, for, for my discussions, uh, I, will uh, I will mostly deal on the the, uh, my comments actually will be mostly focused on the institutional arrangements for trading services as discussed in the presentation, as well as the challenges um, that, that, was, uh, that was presented. Now, on the institutional arrangements uh, for, for trading services negotiations, um, since the Philippines acceded to WTO and the GATS in the 1995, the current trade negotiating agreements has been uh, the results of the result of uh, years of uh, interagency consultation and collaboration, uh, as mentioned by by Director Lin uh, earlier, this is in an effort to achieve the most effective mechanism for the country to attain the benefits from these agreements. Now, the the key moments uh, alluded to in the life cycle of uh, services negotiations, uh, I think by by Marconini and Swab, 2010 begins with services in development plans. Although the PDP recognizes the importance of uh, services and strategies to promote trade in services, it actually does not explicitly state the manner and pace at which the country should be engaged in trade in services agreements. The PDP does mention a strategy to maximize opportunities in bilateral, regional, and global integration and optimize the utilization of existing FTAs, that's chapter 15, 
as platforms to expand market access and diversify products and markets. The same is also mentioned in the export development plan. Uh, for instance, they said in the in the in the in that in the export development plan, uh, it was mentioned to exploit existing and uh, prospective opportunities for trading agreements. So, ganon siya ka, ka, ka general. Uh, but over the years, um, the uh, the IACTS or the Interagency Committee on Trading Services, as presented uh, in the in the presentation, has been the venue for for the dis for discussion of negotiations for bilateral free trade agreements, such as the PJPA, the PHFTA, the PHEU, as well as as well as PH Korea recently. And, uh, the Department of, uh, of uh, Trade in, and Industry, or the DTI, of course, uh, remains the Philippines' uh, lead negotiator for these bilateral trade agreements, with NEDA assigned as the lead negotiator for the services chapter in this, in this agreement. Now, the, the IACTS uh, also discusses Philippine positions relating to the ASEAN Coordinating Committee on Services, or the CCS, primarily on the uh, package of commitments under the AFAS, and same with, with the bilateral agreements, the IACTS uh, recommends the position for consideration of the DTI BIDR as lead negotiator. But if you can see from the presentation, the way it is uh, the, in terms of the structure, you will see there that, uh, that the, the IACTS is, under, is basically under the, the, the technical committee on WTO, on, on WTO matters. Or DCWM. So um, during in in many of, in some of our of our discussions with the IACTS members in the past, they would sometimes um, they would sometimes uh, raise this question on why are we discussing ASEAN matters uh, when in fact this is supposed to be WTO. So so that, that's that's one of the one of the uh, uh, issues or concerns that was raised in. In, in, in the past meetings that I've, that we have uh, facilitated in the in the IACTS. Now going to the challenges, uh, we agree that the existing policy remains restrictive policy regime of the Philippines, particularly in terms of foreign equity limitations. So this priority economic reforms uh, of, of uh, the priority economic reforms to amend. The Public Service Act, um, which is now an enrolled bill, uh, in, in uh, um, with the Office of the President, as well as the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Foreign Investment uh, Act, which has uh, just been recently passed into law, will relax these limitations, uh, especially in the services sector, and will allow the country to be more attractive as an FTA partner. Now, to this end, we expect bilateral partners such as Japan and EFTA. To be interested in reviewing our existing agreements and negotiate better concessions in detail, transport, telecommunication services, once the Public Services Act is passed into law. Now, the, the depth and the coverage of commitments in the GATS is not as extensive uh, compared to, let's say, PJPA and AFAS uh, in terms of the number of sectors and subsectors uh, committed, as uh, presented earlier. And uh, as well as the level of commitments in foreign equity participation. Of course, this is due to the fact that the GATS schedule, which was uh, still committed under the Uruguay round, has not been improved since 1995. And although the Philippines was ready to commit to submit additional offers, improvements at the time, especially in 2008, under the Doha Development Agenda, these negotiations uh, unfortunately, unfortunately came to, to a halt. As uh, these additional offers have found their way in regional and bilateral free trade agreements, such as the ASEAN, ASEAN Plus One, uh, FTAs, uh, the PHFTA, uh, um, and more recently the, the RCEP. Now, on addressing the water in the Philippine commitments, uh, based on our experience um, in, 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 in this area, um, in coordination, of course, with DTI is there also. Um, the, the rationale for scheduling commitments below the existing regime is that although the goal is to further liberalize uh, services sectors, committing below the existing regime allows for policy space in, in, in negotiations, as mentioned also by 
by Mamunet. Uh, uh, the policy space takes into account the possible change in, in regulations during the course of during the course of negotiations. And also during the successive rounds of, of negotiations provide pro, uh, provides flexibility for the country to improve its offers. So this is seen in the offers under the AFA, uh, as well as in the ASEAN China um, uh, uh, FTA, where in successive packages of commitments show improvements in, in, in the offers. Now for public private sector collaboration, we commend the, the Philippine Services Coalition for providing an avenue for such undertaking in the same manner as the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. These two uh, private sector-led groups work closely with government in pushing for initiatives such as the WTO Joint Statement Initiatives on Services Domestic Regulation or the, the JSISDR, and as well as the the OECD Services Trade Restrictiveness Index. So, so we, we appreciate their, their efforts on that. Now, the, the study also highlighted the need to improve the current governance structure of the services trade policy formulation and negotiations. That is to enhance the, the, overall, the overall quality of our free trade agreements. We share the same view to consolidate the negotiations and agree one agency may be in a better position to handle the country's negotiations. It is important uh, that the expertise in trade negotiations is with the agency um, that has the legal mandate to, the, to lead trade negotiations. For instance, countries such as uh, Japan and Korea have a, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, to handle the trade negotiations. But of course, it is supported by relevant government agencies. Now, the same is implemented in Australia, where the foreign affairs and trade and investments are handled by, by one single agency. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, uh, but that is a, a question of, again of policy that has to be to be to be to be discussed and decided uh, as as we as we as we move uh, and and uh, as we move to as we, as we move forward. And this paper can be a can have its contribution to to, to this uh, policy discussion. Now there is also a need to establish the scope. Of the various uh, government bodies, for instance, under AO20, the DFA chairs the, the the PCRC or the Philippine Council for Regional Cooperation, mandated to cover concerns uh, from the ASEAN, APEC, ASEM, and other similar regional initiatives. Now, the PCRC counts under its umbrella the ASEAN Matters Technical Board, chaired by the DFA and the Committee for the ASEAN Economic Community chaired by the DTI. We think that this hierarchy, hierarchy of clearing houses for Philippine positions, at least in the ASEAN, should be fully utilized for more effective coordination. So alternatively, um, the Philippines can also explore the creation of Philippine Trade Representative, Representative Office, similar to, to the US. So, and then, Maybe another challenge or gap that I think that needs to be addressed is how to better capture the utilization of trade agreements in services. Well, this is relatively straightforward in the case of goods. We have no standard way of measuring the same for trading services, which make it, makes it difficult to monitor and, and assess. Um, so I think that's, that I will stop my comments there. Um, uh, but it has, I think, we, it has given me and my team uh, in NEDA and in, in TSIS an opportunity to assess the, the paper, uh, especially in the context of the Philippines' participation in trade services agreements, and consider the importance of established institutional arrangements in negotiation, as well as again we gain a clearer picture of all the commitments in the FTAs of the country. So thank you very much and congratulations to the authors and PIDs for organizing this event. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Director Bien Ganapin of NEDA, for your clear and straightforward uh, comments uh, to the presentation as well as to the uh, recommendations of the authors. We'll, we will hear more from um, Director Bien uh, in the open forum. Okay. So, friends, our discussion this afternoon won't be complete if we don't hear from our um, industry sector, our business community. 
um, and in Dr. Serafika's presentation, she mentioned a very important entity that the government should tap to strengthen the services sector and advance the uh, Philippine services agenda on the global stage. And I'm referring to the Philippine Services Coalition. And we are honored to have with us uh, Ms. Doris Magsaysayho, the co-chair of the Philippine Services Coalition and president and chief executive officer of A. Magsaysay Incorporated, which has its roots in ship owning and has been involved since 1948 in international shipping, transport and logistics services in the Philippines and provision of human resources solutions for companies around the world. Ms. Ho also serves as chair of Lorenzo Shipping Corporation, trustee uh, and director of business and nonprofit organizations and was a member of the APEC Business Advisory Council from 2006 to 2016. She is a recipient of numerous awards and citations in recognition of her leadership and contributions to various industries and pursuits. In 2015, the Office of the President of the Philippines conferred upon Ms. Ho the Order of Gawad Babini with the rank of commander. She holds a master's degree in industrial design from Pratt Institute in New York. Friends, I now give you Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho. Ma'am, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Sheila. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings to fellow reactors, directors Lynn and Bien. Good afternoon. I thank Dr. Arbeta for so kindly honoring me with this invitation to be a reactor to this webinar and congratulate Dr. Dr. Serafika for her very comprehensive presentation and important recommendations on boosting the Philippines' participation in trade agreements for services. I also commend and thank our government officials for their work at the negotiating table. Slide, please. Having represented the Philippines in the APEC Business Advisory Council for over a decade and participated in the APEC and Philippine Services Coalitions, I wholeheartedly agree with the study's conclusions that we need to involve the private sector earlier in the cycle of services negotiations, that we need to simplify the roles of government agencies and to consolidate negotiations in one agency, in which case, in this case, the Department of Trade, and that we need to capacitate our service providers, especially SMS, SMSEs, MISMEs. Slide, please. The lack of this key cultural framework gave me a lot of frustration in my role to represent the country in ABAC, which is a gathering of three business people from the 21 APEC economies. I can only imagine how difficult it is to negotiate an agreement, um, not only with so many agencies involved, but more so without a clearly defined all of government and private sector mandate. Slide, please. When I first joined ABAC in 2026, in 2006, I approached Latin American members. I saw the Mexicans, Peruvians, and Chileans, and I asked them if they were worried about the impact that APEC would, um, APEC liberalization would have on their businesses. They looked at me incredulous, incredulously and said, but we are here to gain access to the markets for our products and services. As a matter of fact, I never heard any fellow ABAC member talk about how to liberalize their economies only how to liberalize others. This may sound so obvious, but for me, it was such an aha moment. What we are missing are the big, hairy, audacious ideas of what products and services we are selling, which is the fundamental reason why economies jump into free trade agreements. Perhaps our successful growth as a consumer economy has not fired our resolve. Oh, sorry, a slide, please. Perhaps our successful growth as a consumer economy has not fired our resolve to be a much more aggressive country in developing a much more strategic way and in scale what products and services we are selling. As Lynn said, how do we differentiate our products and services? Are we competitive with other countries? Are we aiming to be number one in the region? Slide, please. To achieve this, I would suggest not only involving the private sector more, but having a very focused strategic all of government, private sector, labor and civil society approach to identifying and developing and developing the key areas we aim to excel in. This approach would address the weaknesses identified in the paper. 
lack of branding and infrastructure to have the scale and sustainability to make us truly competitive. This effort would also give a clear answer when investors ask or foreigners ask, what drives your economy? Next slide. We can learn from many successful economies that have very clear, unique propositions for their products and services they are selling. The most inspiring to me and the story I love to tell are just small, smallest economies. Singapore, Hong Kong, Brunei, and New Zealand are always the first economies at the negotiation, negotiation table. For example, TPP was not started by, you, by all these big countries. It was started by these four little ones. Why? Because, slide please, because these countries have a productive capacity so much larger than what they, their population can absorb. A country like New Zealand has 27 million sheep for their population of 5 million. So they must grow their access to markets. New Zealand excels at creating great products which they brand. New Zealand lamb chops, New Zealand wine, New Zealand kiwi. You think that's obvious, but if you compare other countries, Canada doesn't say Canada lamb chops, Canada new wine and Canada, Canada apples. They also focus on branding and marketing their services, like their film and post-production services. For example, Lord of the Rings was part of a very strong push by New Zealand for their creative and innovative industries. Next slide, please. Another example of an example of a country with a clear all-of-economy approach is Korea. Who would have thought that we would be all watching Korean TV and learning to listening to their music and yearning to visit Korea to eat their food. The quality of their production reflects the involvement of many agencies of government that are responsible for taxes and in tax incentives, for cultural, uh, cultural promotion, for food promotion, education, etc. Everyone is involved in creating what is Korea's uh, creative uh, prop of, of proposition. I remember a time the Philippines won all the Asian music awards. Remember, we would compete with all the Koreans. We have so much talent here, but we need to do so much work to achieve a program as amazing as Korea's to really have our services present in everybody's mind in all over the region and the world. Slide, please. Peru is another country very determined to balance their commodity trades with agriculture production exports. I tell you, if you visit Lima, you will be eating avocados for breakfast, lunch, merienda, and dinner. The tour guide, the taxi driver, the trade minister all speak with great pride about their avocados. They never serve wine at receptions, only their locally made pisco. As a matter of fact, I think we're the only country that serves wine in Malacanang, while perhaps, next slide, we could learn from this and proudly serve our rum instead of other countries' wines. We could serve banana chips while publicly tracking our banana trade share in markets around the world. However, to achieve this cannot be piecemeal efforts by large and small exporters. Next slide. These countries focus, these focused economies are able to do two things well. One is their ability to crystallize imagination onto a sector in the services, in the, in the, in the service industries that we aim to excel in and become number one. Next slide, please. And the second is to rally the network of people from the government, the business sectors, the academe, civil society, especially labor, and to communicate it, to inspire everyone to work together to promote the services sector. Next slide, please. So here's a chart that that shows why it is so vital to know exactly what it is that we want to, to achieve and where we have the greatest opportunities to excel. Once we know, these are the lists that we've already identified, business process, outsourcing, maritime services, construction service, healthcare, we have creative industries. There's a list that the DTI has put out and NEDA has put out. I've just chosen four. But sometimes um, in my experience in business, we are always running after laws. We're always running after where people should be educated we're all over the place, but once you have very clear goals about what it is we're trying to achieve in each of these sectors, you would have very clear understanding of what cross-cutting policies and laws we need, what enablers of excellence will really drive success and commit to these, um, 
for example, in healthcare, we, India and Thailand are branding themselves, or Singapore are branding themselves as a healthcare center for the region. And we, all our nurses are going and working there. So we should brand the Philippines as a healthcare center, but of course, how it is, how, what do we have to do to achieve that? We know what we, we, we sort of talk about it, but it takes a lot to know, to really roll out the, uh, the infrastructure and the framework to make these businesses truly, truly successful. Uh, R&D, DOST, DOST money should support the startups that support these industry, these service industry sectors. And then once we know what we're after, we will know that we need English in public schools and we'll make sure every parent in this country knows it. We will make math and science cool and make engineering cool because that's where the future is for technology and innovation that Lynn talked about. When you go to India, you'll see banners all over the marketplace saying math and science is the future of India. That is how holistic they approach uh, their goals as a, as a nation. And we will be able to communicate it. We'll be able to brand it, excite our labor, inspire the diaspora to return home to build the sectors. And we will know what infrastructure we need. For example, in shipping, it's as simple as having more direct flights out of the Philippines to major destinations because people have to react if there's a damage in a ship somewhere. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These clearly defined strategic goals will most especially bring government and legislators to develop the policies and laws that cut across many considerations. One example is a unique opportunity to create a great maritime Philippine service center competing with Singapore, by the way. They call themselves Maritime Singapore, which I called our Maritime Philippines. Yet there is a disconnect in policy. The shipping industry is vital to food and national security, so most nations with coasts ensure a strong maritime fleet with strict nationality requirements. Yet the JAPEPA, the PEPJEPA, uh, actually has a clause there where Japan states that in the case of any ships flying the Japanese flag must be owned by, by, by uh, Japanese nation nationals. I sometimes feel that we are so focused on what others want from us rather than what we want from others. Next slide, please. In the case of the construction and healthcare industry, next slide, it, it seems that our posture is to negotiate for the liberalization and facilitation of the entry of Filipino workers or professionals, yet an opportunity for the Philippines would be to have Philippine-based construction companies with or, with, with or without foreign partners to provide construction services. This way, we build a well-trained construction team here, bid for products in Japan, with mobile workers earning high pay but returning home after the project is completed. This ambitious goal requires cross-cutting policies since building our capacity to bid for regional construction projects will require very high specifications from government procurement so that the Philippine-based construction company can build track record. The strategic goals and enablers of excellence will also determine, next slide please, will also determine what other things we need where R&D money, as I said, would spend, what education would be provided, what interest needed, so we can communicate to potential customers and investors, to labor, to young people, to the diaspora. It's tough to achieve, but it's what other economies do. In summary, my takeaways are the need for an all of government, business, labor, and civil society aggressive plan of what services we will aggressively compete in. Number two, based on that, we shift our mindset out of what other economies want from us, to what we want from other economies. And lastly, these strategic goals will help us guide our negotiators in the terms, conditions, and commitments that will enable our service sectors entry into new markets to develop the country towards a path to sustainable development. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho of the Philippine Service Coalition and uh, A. Magsaysay Incorporated. Thank you very much, ma'am, for um, sharing with us um, um, very valuable nuggets of wisdom on how to better position um, the, uh, our services sector in the global market and uh, um, emphasizing um, the importance of uh, um, having a, a clear goal as well as a holistic approach in developing um, the sector as well as uh, the need for a better promotion and uh, um, developing our niche in the, in the global market. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, so friends, um, at this point, we have heard the uh, reactions of our um, uh, speakers. 
um, our discussions and uh, we have now come to the next part of our webinar which is um, the open forum and this time we would like to hear from you but before I start I, I start reading your questions uh, let's have a poll okay that will also give our uh, reactors a chance to uh, to rest a bit before they start uh, answering uh, questions okay so let's have a poll and um, okay Earlier, we heard our discussions reaction to the recommendation of Dr. Serafika and Ms. Aren on consolidating trade negotiations in just uh, one agency. And uh, we heard uh, uh, both Director Bien and Ms. Ho concurred uh, to the author's suggestion. So let's find out if our participants have the same views as our discussants. And this poll is open to our participants on WebEx and our viewers on Facebook. So here's our poll question. Are you in favor of having a single government agency that will handle all international trade negotiations for the Philippines, including coordination with other departments and formulation of trade positions? Okay, is it yes or no? Again, are you in favor of having a single government agency that will handle all international trade negotiations for the Philippines, including coordination with other departments and formulation of trade positions? Okay, so you may uh, answer now. We are giving you 10 seconds to answer this question and we'll flash the results right away. Gwen, please let us know when the time is up. Elizabeth, and I'm now closing the poll. Okay. And uh, um, how many minutes will it take for WebEx to uh, process the uh, results? Uh, 20 seconds. It's just 20 seconds. So, hintay lang tayo ng saglit. So, um, you may have uh, questions to our uh, speakers. Just use the chat box. We will uh, proceed to the open forum right after I show you the uh, our poll results. Okay, is it ready now? Okay. Uh, more are in favor of having just one single agency. So 74 answered yes and only 11 answered no. So there you have it. Okay. Um, and as a token of our appreciation to those who participate in our poll, we'll pick two names each from WebEx and Facebook and we will give them a prize. And I will uh, announce the winners before we uh, end the webinar. Okay. So let us now go to our uh, open forum and at this point, and I'll invite our presenter, Dr. Serafik, and our reactors, Ms. Ho, Director Bien Ganapin, and Director Lin Akia to join us in the open forum. Okay, so we have a question from, um, let me check our chat box. Okay, we have a question from Joel Tan Torres. Um, for service providers, specifically, or especially professional professionals um, or lawyers, do the FTAs, including RCEP, provide for unrestricted access or require regulatory oversight or intervention, such as approvals for access from the Professional Regulatory Commission? I think um, Director Lynn has answered this question in the chat box, but for, for the benefit of our uh, WebEx participants and our Facebook viewers, Director Lin, uh, may we have your uh, response on this? Hi, Dr. Pilea. Um, the answer, our answer is that for legal pro professions, we, we do not have commitments on legal services in any of our FTAs on services. Um, this is because the practice of legal professions is limited to Filipinos as stipulated in our constitution. So for other professionals, RCEP does not have a guarantee for, of unrestricted, unrestricted access as professionals coming in the Philippines are still subject to measures such as the labor market tax and immigration formalities. Just to recall for uh, on the Philippine Constitution, Article 12, uh, Section 14, Article 12, the practice of all professions in the Philippines shall be limited to Filipino citizens, safe in cases prescribed by the law, and if the activity constitutes the practice of a regulated profession uh, under Philippine laws and regulations, the, the professional must secure a special permit uh, from the PRC pursuant to RA 
one, which is the PLC Modern Space Program. Ah, but then they also need to get an alien employment permit from the DOLE pursuant to the labor code. And then, of course, the, the professional need to comply with the requirements relative to the practice of the profession uh, by foreign national as provided in the uh, in our regulatory. So that's the long answer. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Director Lin. Okay. Uh, no other questions in our uh, uh, chat box? Let me uh, check our uh, Facebook. Okay, none yet. Um, okay, let's um let's go to uh, uh some of the recommendations uh mentioned by uh director by uh Dr. Serafica, one of which was involving uh one of which is to involve the um private sector um earlier in the cycle of services uh, negotiations. What um mechanisms are available for private sector participation? Um may how 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 can they you know um how, how can we operationalize this uh, recommendation and what mechanisms are already available can i can i start yes uh, please um, okay so, so i think uh, i i mentioned to um uh, miss doris earlier there's an opportunity now that we're going to have a new administration and have a uh, we will be preparing a new uh, medium-term development plan. Uh, there's an opportunity to engage the private sector in drafting uh, the chapter on services. So, and maybe this time around, we can have a separate chapter on services, uh, uh, not combined with industry anymore. So that's one opportunity. And as I mentioned, that's the first step in trade negotiations to have a national plan Mm -hmm. ensure that the goals and visions are articulated at the highest possible uh, planning document. Uh, and then I think uh, moving for, for in terms of the other steps, then uh, I think the D, well, both DTI if, uh, and NED, if I'm not mistaken, they do engage the private sector. Uh, but maybe uh, it's also a, a sort of a, a sensitive issue because state negotiations are supposed to be in a way secretive right mm -hmm. there's some aspect to that so uh, i think uh, but if you engage the right people and there's a formal channel and formal um mechanism then i think that's one way to make sure that you achieve the transparency but at the same time the strategic nature of services negotiations uh would be upheld um yeah so that's my view thank you very much um Monette. Um, may, may I comment? Yes, ma'am. Um, Go ahead, ma'am. So leading up to leading up to that particular negotiation that um, that Dr. Serafika speaks about, I'm really speaking about something way before that. Uh, not even for the negotiation. It's really for what we want to sell. I mean, it sounds as simple as that. If I were to ask everybody in a survey now, what are we selling that drives our economy? I can promise you it's not very easy to answer. Most people will say foreign or uh, overseas worker, right? Okay, we can say BPO, we can say whatever, but it's not so clear. Unlike, let's say, if you talk to a Korean and say, what services are you selling? They will all say our creatives industries, right? So I feel that, I don't know. I mean, I've been racking my brain, Dr. Serafika, about where that kind of discussion takes place. I've, I've joined many, many of these kind of planning, planning, but they're, one of the things I learned under when we were discussing the PSA with Congress is you talk to PSA with Congress and they talk about liberalization, but if you talk about national security, they say well, that's not in our purview. That's another policy. They're, they're, who, who's in charge of looking at the different national policies in relation to what it is that we want to sell? Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Uh, but Director Bien talked about liberalizing our own internal ownership issues and whatever let's say land you know we, we tend to sort of feel so defensive that oh we better open up we're always looking at what's wrong with us if you look at other countries we're not much is wrong i remember singaporeans saying oh you guys have so many you know restrictions and barriers to entry i said well in singapore do you allow anyone to invest in your water and they said oh no all right or in australia they don't allow uh, foreigners to own land more than x it has to be leased or uh, in China, it's all lease, 
they don't let people own their land. So why can't we learn from those? Mm -hmm. We can learn from what are those things that, that the constitution and that it's with them thought of and then think of, hey, puede palang lease long term. So mm -hmm. uh, the point is, what do we want as a country? What do we want for ourselves to excel and to be number one? Mm -hmm. And then once we have that, I promise you, we don't even have to have a secret meeting with NEDA because they will know what to do and what to ask for. But we, we, we approach negotiation with a clear understanding of what we want as a country, what we want for ourselves, and that we will be aggressively trying to enter other markets. Thank you very much, Ms. Ho. Director Ganapin, would you like to share your thoughts on this matter? Um, yeah, uh, yeah just, just, a, just my thought. No? Uh, in terms of, um, of uh, I was thinking because of the, the question is how do we do we engage more the, the, the private sector? So in, in, in our experience in the, in the uh, uh, IAC on, on traded services, uh, what we engage are the implementing agencies. Uh, these implementing agencies, although at the back of our minds, uh, the, the assumption here is that these implementing agencies have their own stakeholders. Uh, so we ask uh, we ask uh, the, the 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 member agencies um, is there a particular interest in your in your in your sector that uh, 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 that we can that we can include as our offensive interest. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 in in terms of the process uh, of for for trade negotiations. That's that's the that's how we. That's, that's our experience. So here, I think the opportunity here is that we can engage more the private mm -hmm. the, 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 the private sector by engaging them, by, by the implementing agencies engaging their stakeholders to ask them, to consult with them on a regular basis, what are their interests? And if, if, if this is their interest, is there any capacity for them to expand their, their markets abroad, uh, their, their, uh, to, to, to deliver the, or to supply the necessary services demanded by, by, by potential markets abroad. Um, and then if there, is this, if there are avenues where government can intervene to, to, to improve their capacities, building their capacities, then I think that's, that's, uh, that's a, 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 a good way to, to improve our, our engagement with the with the private sector. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that we need to improve the um, um, our engagement with the private sector, perhaps uh, um, uh, create uh, uh, other mechanisms or, uh, or probably improve existing ones. Um, Director um, Lynn? Lynn, would you like to uh, um, contribute to the conversation? Uh, yeah, Dr. Sheila, I think um, what um, Ma'am Dori said is really the idea, like you have a services roadmap uh, for all. So what we actually have right now is a roadmap for the different services sector, because if you use services, there's a lot in the different sectors. So we came up with the POI, the DTI came up with different services or a different roadmap. So some of them cover user services sector, some cover industrial, etc. So that is one initiative that we can continue to uh, to parang do on a regular basis, update it, and we do consult heavily with the private sector when we, when we come up with the roadmaps. The other thing that I was uh, para involved in that I think is a good model is when we when we as we implement the e-commerce roadmap, and there is one project uh, which which the DTI is leading. It's drafting a model agreement for e-commerce or for digital trade, and we started off with a study uh, done by Dr. Uh, Thomas Aquino, and we are doing consultations heavily on this and we spoke with the government sector, we spoke also with the private sector. So I think that's one way to bring in uh, the private sector uh, even before you start. So you do the scoping study, then you do uh, this one, we came up with a 
parang a draft uh, agreement. So we put all our parang our interest in it. So that's one way to get the private sector to engage. I think that's uh, no, parang, uh, a useful model that we can uh, do with the rest of the roadmaps that we have now. Can, but, can I... um, yes, please again. Mom Doris, go, Mom Doris, go ahead. I wanted to say that it's also the fault of the private sector uh, for not being clear about its own roadmap. Actually, the best roadmap came from the BPO sector because they have McKinsey who did it. They were funded. I don't know who funds them, but these are very big, big companies. Accenture Converge is huge. It costs about over a million dollars to get McKinsey to do something like that. And, um, you know, so that we, we have to find the money to get a real professional uh, group that can do R&D and research, whether it's a domestic uh, think tank, maybe PITS, and, or and a foreign one to really think about where we can be most competitive and help each sector that we think has the greatest opportunity to have a roadmap. And then, and then maybe um, NEDA, NEDA can, can bring all the other agencies together, uh, national security, whatever, uh, the education, et cetera. Um, I asked, um, and I, I, one of the things that I think NEDA's role is vital because it's developmental and Hopefully the next president sits in those meetings and so that means every cabinet member is there. And that way it really becomes a developmental, a really business-like developmental organization. With Thank, you roadmaps, yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Ho and uh, Director Lin. Uh, there's a comment here from Patrick Chua. Uh, the Philippine Innovation Act mandates the crafting of the national innovation agenda and a strategy document. Perhaps this is also an entry point for the national plan where we can rally behind as the Philippines. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, uh, for your um, uh, comment. And uh, moving on, uh, we have another question here from uh, from uh, Dio Marie Estor uh, from the Department of Finance. Um, I'll read uh, his question. Uh, he would like, uh, okay, he's addressing this question to PIDS NED or DTI. Um, I know that the absence of official statistics on outward FDI and or PATS, uh, foreign affiliate trade statistics that could provide information on the direct investments or sales of Philippine companies overseas. What course of action uh, do you suggest for this gap to be addressed? um perhaps we can um who wants to um answer this first director bien or lynn um yeah if i may yes please um, yeah, go ahead I, yes i think on on the on the investment side what what is available in the in the uh, banco central's uh, website is the net fdi uh, but if you look at if you look at the data uh, in detail, the net FDI is actually the, the the net of the inflows and outflows. So we have actually, I think we have a, a data there um, uh, on on the outflow, and it's uh, it's a uh, um, parang parang uh, there is an outflow of, of FDI uh, the outflow and then an inflow, but uh, and then it's it's also categorized by by sector. So you have agriculture, manufacturing, etc., and other services. So for if if we're looking for the for the Philippines outward uh, 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 investments in other countries, then you can look at the the, the 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 one one component of the net FDI, which is the the outflow uh, of, of of FDI. So that 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 means this is these are uh, Filipinos, Philippine investors. That that uh, that invest outside. Uh, they're, they're, that, that's it, that are investing outside of the country or, or in other countries. So that's my that's my 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 uh, my contribution to, to to the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director yeah. Bien. Um, um, can I say something? Yeah. Yes. So th this is also my frustration, actually. Uh, uh, I think from five years ago, I've already been asking for this kind of data. But I think the the solution is really to compile the data. <laughs> There's no way around it, and I'm not sure if 
perhaps it's NEDA uh, can uh, designate or uh, mandate the PSA and uh, BSP because these are the two uh, organizations that compile uh, statistics and to make sure that uh, you know if the facts in particular should be we should start collecting compiling data on this because this is actually the evidence that we need later on if you want to say that for example foreign companies are contributing to our country in terms of r d or in terms of employment in terms of sales and what is the evidence for that and you can only get that if you compile the facts so i i would i hope um director <laughs> would um, as NEDA, as NEDA um, in charge of uh, uh, statistics or the as our mother agency uh, could uh, compel the PSA and the other organization the other agency would be BSP I believe to produce this data because it's when you look at the websites of other countries it's really um, you know they have they're more I mean I think they're also as um, also developing countries like us but for some reason they might they are able to produce uh, the data that's, uh, that's very useful. So um, yeah, I think it starts with a mandate coming from our decision from NEDA. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's my uh, suggestion. Thank you. Um, if, 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 if I may, uh, just, just a rejoinder for, for, uh, from uh, what uh, Mamunet uh, uh, said. Uh, actually, there is, a, there is a mechanism already. Uh, there's, there's this uh, interagency um, interagency committee on, on on investment statistics that that discusses this you know, these uh, issues or concerns or whether there are gaps and, and, and I'm glad that, that this has been brought up so we can we can also uh, because NEDA also sits in the in that in that interagency or in, in that TWG technical working group this is uh, this is uh, facilitated by the PSA uh, the the Philippine Statistics Authority so they are the secretariat for this uh, TWG and and we can we can actually uh, as, as NEDA is also uh, is also part of that of that TWG uh, on investment statistics then we can we can uh, we can bring that up as part of addressing the the gaps on 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 statistics particularly on investments thank you ma'am thank you Thank you very much, uh, Mamunet and uh, Director Bien. Um, would you have anything to contribute, uh, Ma'am Lin, Director Lin? Just to say, Dr. Tila, that we agree on the need for better uh, investment statistics, both uh, inward and outward. I mean, we, we get them from, I mean, we have it, but uh, sometimes it's really parang very hard to obtain even you want uh, updated ones <coughs> thank you very much okay uh while we're waiting for um a few more questions from our participants uh um i have a question from um, uh from um doris uh perhaps not a lot of people know about uh are familiar with the philippine services coalition um ma'am would you uh like to give us um details about what the coalition does how how um, its activities uh, particularly on uh, how it uh, um, it's advocating for uh, meaningful reforms uh, for the services sector and how it is um, um, trying to influence or let's say uh, advocate or um, um, you know um, promote the services industry thank you well the philippines the services coalition actually there was a, an APEC Services Coalition, which was actually started, I think, if I'm not mistaken, by G but I think the Philippines presented that, right, um, somewhere along the way. So when we chaired APEC, we really decided to really put some life into the into the APEC Services Coalition, uh, the, Philippi the, the APEC Services Coalition. And uh, to support that, we created the Philippine Services Coalition. So we brought in those industries that we felt the industries that we felt based on some of the studies that have been made by DTI, et cetera, uh, that would have the greatest chance to really scale, not little bitsy things, but scale into real industries that could be really uh, have gain, gain um, real strong positioning in the region. So as I said, BPO, healthcare, um, uh, and education, education, what they, the education wanted to be part of it. But it was really construction, maritime, uh, BPO, and uh, and um, 
And now there's uh, Patrick Chua mentioned innovation. We haven't really brought in innovation. So we've met several times and I must say the pandemic kind of died. But, um, but I think the frustration in those meetings is as I said, we can talk and talk and talk, but we, we need some structure on how to get that industry to really be able to put a very, very organized fashion, the strategy of how to make ourselves really great. So for an example, the, the, I mentioned McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey was actually willing to help us in 2015 to come up with, uh, they, they even offered to do it for free, believe it or not. But because the elections were coming in 2016, they said, let's wait for the next president. So this part, this, they didn't work during this administration because it was the focus on this administration was infrastructure. So as, as, as um, Dr. Dr. Serafika mentioned, maybe in the next presidency, we can really focus on it, but it really requires some kind of a structure of somebody helping us. As I said, uh, <clears throat> even uh, Malaysia, I flew to Malaysia with McKinsey and I met the head of their overall planning um, team that was uh, appointed by their prime minister to come up with their uh, services and products and trade and goods um, uh, uh, workshops. And they're very clear. I mean, they, they don't just say in Malaysia, they didn't say we will be in manufacturing. They didn't say that. They said, we will be the number one light bulb producer in the world. Okay, so they're very specific. And they, in Malaysia, they actually put in the newspaper every day, today we made it, today we didn't. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, so we hope that the Services Coalition can be revived um, now that the things are back to normal. But I think it needs to be together with government. Mm -hmm. we, it needs to be in a certain framework and it needs a consultant to help us, honestly. So I wonder if there could be a budget in NEDA or somewhere to help this kind of thinking and just not for every single industry, maybe six or seven are the ones we identify where we have the greatest opportunity. <laughs> okay, uh, you mentioned um, uh, identify six uh, industries where we have the greatest op opportunity. Can you give us um, um, our what are the low hanging fruits in, in in your opinion? Our low hanging fruits? Yes, I can really well. Um, let's say BPO, which is really so easy for everybody to understand, right? Uh, I haven't really read their 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 roadmap and study that their their recent updated uh, roadmap. I haven't read it, but obviously, you know, uh, they had some issues about incentives being removed. Uh, so ideally, you know, those can be very clear, um, but um, it's not really low hanging fruit, but I think it's very clear hanging fruit, which is education, right? And so if, 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 we, if we as a country were to say, this is gonna be with great, in, with great ambition, with great determination, we're gonna be the best BPO, center in the world, everybody, our schools must speak English and really do it well. And wala nang aywa, wala nang away. You know, wala nang, bakit ba may math, bakit may makanyan? It needs a strong hand that says, no, this is our future. Parang kulang sa political will, no? Um, so the low hanging fruit is the political will. <laughs> because we kind of know what we want. I'll give you another example, not in services, but in trade uh, of goods. Do you know that we need, there, there are companies that need a million mangoes a day, and then there are companies that need masses of coconut water. And can I tell you the problem? We don't have enough production. I mean, in business, our big, my problem is finding my customer. Imagine there's a customer. So imagine, so the low hanging fruit is start planting, but that requires many things, right? It needs the right seedlings, right R&D, so that kind of holistic thing that we're going to focus on this is the pattern of focus, mindset, mm -hmm. and political mm -hmm. will. Thank you very much, Ms. Ha. Okay, uh, we have uh, another question here, an interesting one, relevant one in the context of the pandemic. And this one is from uh, Mr. Vicente Camillon Jr. He said, the services sector was the worst hit by the pandemic. Can we therefore depend the long-term development of the country on a service-oriented economic development strategy? Um, would you like? Yeah, I, yes. can, I can try. Yes, Dr. So, Manette, yeah, so, for, so I, I'm focused on services, but even I do not advocate uh, that we 
actually push for just a services oriented uh, strategy. It's just that it's a stylized fact that uh, as countries evolve or grow, the share of services also grows with that. But I remember seeing this line that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Mm. So yes, services, but we don't want the low value adding type of services, right? You want to move up the value chain. And so that's where the, the shift to digital economy is relevant. And this can apply not just for services, but you know, from um, agriculture to manufacturing, so on. Across all the different um, activities or economic sectors, we need to move up the value chain and not just services uh, without considering whether it's a high value adding service or not. Thank you very much, Dr. Serafika. Um, Director Bien, I saw you nodding your head, so may I call you first, then followed by um, um, Director Lin and then Ms. Ho. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, for services, uh, services are, are actually complementary to other other um, uh, sectors, no, the, the agriculture and, and industry. We need we need logistics, for instance, to 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 transport our 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 products, our agricultural products, or our manufactured products from one place to another, or from one from the Philippines to other countries. So that's why it's important that that that, that there are that a services is a, services is there to. To, to want to support the you know the 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 other sectors of the economy and then second also services in itself uh, creates a, a, a value to to the economy uh, as a whole um, now whether or not we rely so wholly or 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 not um, I think I agree with with Mamonet uh, that uh, that uh, we should not rely wholly to the to, to the services but again. We cannot live without 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 services. Now, having said that, um, uh, for I think there are ways that we can make our services more resilient, uh, especially when there are pandemics that that, that like like for, like for now or, or disasters or or um, or whether man-made or natural disasters, um, we can make uh, the services uh, resilient. Uh, one example that I can think of readily is uh, making it uh, more digital. Uh, the digital digital transformation of, of many services um uh, many many of our services can be can be part of making them more resilient to to shocks such as um um uh, pandemic and, 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 and so thank you thank you very much director uh bien uh director lin yeah, thank you, Dr. Tia. I think the, the short answer to the question of can we depend is no, because you have to spread your risk all the time. Depending on is lang ititikin mo, so you have to uh, you have to have the goods. You have to have uh, and then when you have the goods, uh, that's also supported by services. Eh? The glue is the services, right? So we need to be really competitive to services. But that doesn't mean that it all has to be about services. Then the other thing is what the, uh, Director Bien mentioned is the, the digitalization of these services, which I also mentioned earlier. We need to uh, be competitive with that because that's where the, the future is. I mean, that will also make us more resilient. Like those who were already, those who have adopted a digital model, they were the ones who thrived during the pandemic. So good and then, uh, we go e-digital also on our services. Thank you very much, Director Lin. Ms. Ho, any thoughts, ma'am? Ma'am, you're, you're on mute. I wanted to say during the pandemic, the shipping and logistics services did not stop even putting all our people in harm's way. And even at massive losses, it continued to deliver food, medicine, and goods needed by the people. So I just wanted to say that because sometimes people don't notice these services are very invisible. You don't know how something got to you, but it got to you, right? Um, the second part is that the most, what I've learned in really thinking about all this, I'm not an economist, but what I notice uh, from what people, what, what I've read, is that the most successful economies are the ones with the most complex economic offerings, right? Whether it's in product services, 
or whatever. So the most economic, the more economic complexity the country has, the better. So hopefully we can create many, many areas where we excel. Okay, I said five, maybe we could 10. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, they pick their top 20 on their GDP and, um, and, and really just really make it, as Dr. Sarafika said, go for quality. Uh, but, you know, we have to be very quick because, you know, places like the Pearl River Delta, which used to call itself the factory of the world, is now calling itself the technology center of the world. Um, you have Singapore uh, now saying it's now a, an innovation hub. So those are words that only come from, the, from intent, right? Mm -hmm. So are we going to be what? You know, are we any kind of hub? Are we any kind of anything? So we have to really decide what is that that we are that people say ah philippines yeah that's the blank hub and hopefully we can do that thank you very much man okay and then no more questions from our participants um uh, okay there's one more um and let me read it and this one is from um kimberly okay uh, Kimberly made Chandra, in light of the fourth industrial revolution, what is the government currently doing to retool or upskill Filipinos so that we can remain truly competitive, in particular under the Philippine Innovation Act, what has been done uh, to promote, okay, sorry about that uh, what has been done to promote a culture of innovation in terms of ensuring future skills for displaced workers due to disruptive technologies climate change or other emergent uh factors well actually this topic has been covered or this question has been answered in our past uh webinars but uh uh may i give uh, the opportunity to our discussants to um and and, and to dr serafica to give their views on this Okay, in, in terms of uh, re retooling, um, retooling our workforce to ensure that they are uh, ready for, um, ready to face the uh, the pressures or uh, the the uh, what's expected of them under the fourth industrial <laughs> revolution. Um, can we start with uh, Miss Ho? Uh. In terms of your industry, ma'am, uh, what? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of the things, you know, the Philippines is the number one seafaring nation in the world. And I want to explain that seafarers are not overseas workers. They're professionals who work for 10 months, come home, that's work right. for 10 months, come home. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're I, you're starting to see ships that are, these are future, future of work, right? What is the future of work? So you're starting to see ships that are very digitally oriented. You're starting to ship, see ships with, with different kinds of engines, different batteries, you know, Internet of Things. Yeah, so we're all thinking how do we how do we now train our future seafarer our seafarers today and those that, that are being trained for the future how to be that 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 person I mean if we ever have automated ships where will our seafarers go how can they now still play an important role in that future world um, so yeah and again I guess it falls down also again to that comment about the comment I made earlier about education. We already know, we already know that science and, and math is very important and mm -hmm. our, 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 we have to start very young. The kids have to love mm -hmm. math and, and, and science at, at, at the, in grade the elementary school. Thank you very much, Ms. Hall. Okay, any thoughts from our uh, discussants? Um, Director Lin or Director uh, um, Bien? Ms. Monet? Anyone? Yes, Monet. Uh, yeah, just um, yeah. There are so many programs, at least from what I know. Um, D DICT, DTI, especially the innovation group led by uh, USEC Aldaba, uh, they've partnered with uh, Skills Future of Singapore, I think, to um, at least develop a framework. Um, uh, DICT, uh, DOST. So a lot of agencies are already, um, I think, introducing programs for upskilling and reskilling. So um, the Innovation Act, well, I think Neda is the co-chair of the Innovation Act. So perhaps uh, Director Bian would like to uh, elaborate on what what is the uh, what are the activities planned for to, to implement the Innovation Act. 
Thank you very much, uh, Munet. Uh, Director Bien, yes, um, go ahead. Yes, yes. Just uh, with regards on to the to the Philippine Innovation Act, the the first the the, the Philippine Innovation Act, the, the Council has just uh, met the first time. Uh, I think early this year, uh, and then the, the that's in, that's also uh, the I, I would also like to inform everyone that the that, that uh, to move forward on this uh, in implementation of the Innovation Act. Um, the, the NEDA is preparing the the national uh, innovation uh, framework, something 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 like a a, a plan, uh, uh, because it's it's mandated in the law to that for to have a a, a national innovation uh, uh, plan, both for for the medium term and and the long term plan, and uh, for in terms of of, of uh, adding. Uh, people uh, in, in NEDA, we, we, we were just uh, uh, waiting for. Uh, actually, no, uh, we, we the DBM has just approved has approved our our request to have a, a unit here in NEDA uh, that will that will mod, that will uh, uh, form part of the secretariat to the Innovation Council and the, the technical staff also uh, to 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 handle the. The, the, the innovation we have uh, and what we call it, the innovation staff it's, it's the newly created uh, um, a unit here in NEDA uh, that is specifically to 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 formulate the the the, the national innovation uh, uh, plan and uh, also to act as a secretariat for for the innovation council so thank, thank you. you very much director bien and um lynn would you have anything to say I don't have anything substantive to add, but I just know that our innovation group led by Dr. Albert Dava is very busy and very active mm -hmm. working with the uh, different educational institutions, working with the DOSP and the NENA. I think there, there, is, there is this, they're the ones who drafted the IR. So they, there are many instruments that were identified to implement the, the innovation act. And I know that um, there's a lot, and those that uh, parang they also interface with the different roadmaps. So yeah, that's that's what I can share from my side. Thank you very much. Okay. May I comment, please, Sam? Um, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. You know, one thing I learned because innovation was actually one of the things that during our APEC 2015 hosting we really pushed for as part of the agenda. Lynn, we worked a lot in putting it there, and um, and uh, and as a result of that we actually were involved in pushing for this innovation act. And, um, but I learned one thing that I want to share with you during that time that we were pushing innovation because I, I didn't even understand what innovation meant. We talk about it, it's such a big word, but I said, what does it mean? So I, I asked, uh, one, one, one learning I got was Dado Banatao. You, you all know Dado Banatao? He's a very famous, uh, a very successful Filipino living in Silicon Valley. And I asked him, what is it? He said, well, innovation, has to be market driven so when you do r d it must be market driven there has to be a market response to some market need right so again it falls into the, the realm of this this strategic plan of whether it's your products or services that we have because the best way to empower smes mismes and startups is to support the plan of someone bigger I mean, uh, it's, it, 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 it responds to a need. And aside from our own roadmaps, we could have an amazing startup community that could address issues like poverty because we have a lot of it. We could address climate change because we have 21 typhoons. So um, it's sort of, again, holistic. And, and uh, that's why I wanted to say maybe NEDA and DTI could work together with companies like McKinsey are actually helping Singapore develop its innovation plan. And Singapore is very focused on certain things as well. Healthcare. Every single startup in the world is going to Singapore to do healthcare startups in, in, in real technology um, solutions for healthcare. So anyway, I just wanted to say that it's it's got to be market driven, not just this sort of academic thing. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ms. Ha. Okay, we have a, um, a question. Okay. 
Um, Sherilyn uh, typed in something here. I thought about starting Manila. The first one was held in 2015. Okay, we have a brief question here from Anthony uh, Joaquin Cadiz, and he is asking how he can obtain the long-term development plan of Ambition Nat in 2040. Well, I think everything is in your website, uh, isn't it, uh, uh, Director Bien? Every, uh, Information related to the Ambition and also the uh, PDP, they can get it from uh, the NEDA website. Yes. Okay, so friends, so uh, what a lively discussion we just had. And to cap our, um, to cap our uh, conversation uh, this afternoon, may I ask uh, our um, um, speakers from, uh, for some brief final remarks, starting with uh, Dr. Serapika. Okay, so first of all, thank you uh, for organizing this webinar, Sheila, and thank you to all the participants, especially our guests' uh, discussions. Uh, I guess my key message is that uh, we um, just encourage uh, everyone to actively participate and take advantage of the opportunities in trade agreements uh, because it really allows us to exploit our comparative advantage, which is uh, I think it, it's re well recognized that the Philippines has comparative advantage in services. And also these uh, processes uh, allow us to improve our own domestic industries. So it's a two-way uh, street uh, in terms of uh, you know, benefiting from our participation. So I, I guess that's the only message I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Serafika. And Director uh, Bien? Um. I um, yeah, nothing much to, to say uh, except that uh, maybe um, um, as 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 uh, as a unit in NEDA for, uh, that is also advocating for for services. Um, I think there are a lot of things that need to be done on the part of the government, and um, but uh, I think by uh, we, I, I agree that uh, we need to engage more the the private sector. Uh, as as mentioned by by Mam um, Mam Doris, um, and uh, just to, to just to plug lang, <laughs> so my, for those who, who are interested in in uh, knowing more about innovation, um, the NEDA is uh, is, is having a, a, a uh, it's available in, in in Facebook I think uh, or uh, there's an Ask NEDA um, um, next week. Uh, it will talk about uh, the the innovation. Uh, and the, the 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 latest updates on the on the innovation uh, act the, it's, and the, it's, its implementation. So, yung, yung, that's that's the uh, that's the, that's uh, that's that's uh, for the for the for the next week activity of NEDA. And uh, I just mentioned on the, the innovation plan is actually officially called National Innovation Strategy Document or the the NSD, and and it will be published uh, hopefully by by Q3 of this year. So, so thank you very much for uh, for inviting Ned again. Thank you. And thank you very much, Director uh, Ganapin, for those updates. And Director Lin? Thank you to PIDS for inviting us at the DPI. We always talk about inclusive growth and inclusive trade, and really we want to practice what we preach. So we are now really trying to be very transparent <clears throat> so we want to hear from you. We want to hear from everyone, the business, the big uh, companies, the academia, um, the different uh, branches of government. And when we make, when we invite you, I hope you can come because we need those information that you have. We may not agree on everything at first, but I think we are all, we all want this nation to be prosperous. We want, uh, we want to to rise and really become um, parang be proud of our country. So I hope that you can participate in in all of our when we in when we make invitations. And then to the ideas, I hope you will continue these discussions. These are very important venues for for us, and I hope that uh, as many people can also be. Uh, included and invited. So thank you once again, and I look forward to the next uh, invitation. Thank you very much, Director Lin. And of course, uh, Ms. Doris Magsaysayho, ma'am. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, PIDS for inviting me. Thank you, I'm really honored. I really enjoyed seeing my old friends here, Monette and Lin, and meeting Bien. 
every time I see you as such dedicated people, I always have hope for our country. Um, as, as Lynn said, or as somebody said, our greatest competitive advantage for services is our great and talented people. So we really owe it to them. We do, we really owe it to them. It's no longer something sana, sana, no. We owe it to this 90 million, 100 million people to rally together, to agree on what it is we're selling, whether in goods or services, and to really um, be the best in whatever we decide will be the key things that we sell. Um, I, I will commit now myself that the public, the, 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 uh, the Sur Philippine Services Coalition, I will tell Bill Luz, we gotta meet again, gather, gather everyone together, but we really need some support. We need to agree among the DTI and NEDA how we are able to work together so we're not all work, working in vacuums. Listening to Bien, it goes from our, our agencies, it gets, it gets watered down by the time it gets to NEDA. So we got to be able to put a document that everyone signs on and um, because we owe it to our people to do something that brings us to prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ho. Friends, please join me in uh, thanking our paper authors led by uh, Dr. Ramon Serapica mm -hmm. and of course our panel of reactors, Director um, Lynn Akia of the BITR, Director Bien Ganapin of NEDA, and Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho of the Philippine Services Coalition and A Magsaysay Incorporated. Let us, all, let us give all of them a big virtual clap. And before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our uh, poll. Uh, well, we have three winners, but only on WebEx, none participated in, on Facebook. We have uh, Shane Custodio and Marian Bringas. So Shane Custodio and Marian Bringas, uh, thank you very much for joining our poll and our um, webinar team will contact you for your prize. Okay, and finally, we have some reminders. So uh, you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar from the PIDS website and flash on the screen is also the full link to uh, the link to the full study. We encourage you to uh, to uh, uh, get a copy of, of the full study for uh, more details about uh, the study of uh, Dr. Asurafika and Ms. Orin. And please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen uh, after this webinar and we will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are very important to us to improve our webinars. And uh, please uh, regularly visit our uh, website and our social media pages. Uh, so we, we, we have a, a YouTube account, uh, I mean a YouTube channel, so all the recordings of our uh, past uh, webinars, including our face-to-face -face, uh, seminars uh, before the pandemic, you can find all the recordings on our YouTube channel. And uh, please join us in our we uh, next webinar uh, that's on uh, uh, <clears throat> 17 next uh, Thursday. We will talk about uh, the readiness of Philippine cities to smart city development. And finally, we would like to thank, um, we would like to acknowledge uh, the various organizations from the government, academe, uh, civil society, business, an international development community who joined us today. So their names are flashed on the screen. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. So this concludes our webinar for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week. Maraming salamat po. Thank you again. Bye-bye.